the right stuff. But there is another side to Cooper's lifetime in aviation, one that for years he would only discuss with close friends until now. It involves his personal encounters with UFOs. For him, it began in 1951 while flying in Europe for the U.S. Air Force. There, Cooper and other pilots witnessed an incident that has never been officially explained. A vast armada of UFOs flying in formation at extremely high altitudes. Recently, Yolanda Gaskin spoke with Gordon Cooper. In this exclusive interview, Colonel Cooper spoke for the first time on television about his encounters with UFOs. I've read about this incident you had in 1951, and you said you saw literally hundreds of unidentifiable flying objects. Yes, they were flying quite high. How high, we couldn't tell because we couldn't get anywhere near their altitude. But they were either very large craft way up or smaller crafts still well above what we could get to. For a day and a half, all of this happened. But then no one wanted to talk about it. Well, we sent a report forward on it, and, and the answer that finally came back months later was they were probably high-flying seed pods, which didn't sound very logical. There are always a lot of excuses. There's always um, the weather balloons. I've heard that one before. Oh, yeah. In yeah. 1951, you couldn't even get close to That's the true. things that were flying overhead. You or anyone else that was flying. They were faster, higher. Six years later, Cooper again encountered a UFO. This one definitely was not a weather balloon. While supervising flight testing in Edwards Air Force Base, his military camera crew actually filmed an unidentified saucer-shaped object landing near the site. As they were sitting there filming, a little saucer came from, uh, I say little saucer, it was a saucer, came flying over their heads, put down three little landing gear and landed right out on the dry lake bed. And they picked up their cameras and started over toward it, filming as they went. And when they got in fairly close to it, it lifted up, put the gear back in the wheel wells, tipped up, and took off at a great rate of speed. And so they brought the, came into my office and told me what had happened, and I sent them over to develop the film, and then had to go through the, all the proper regulations of reporting this. And, and we wound up having to send the film forward to Washington in the uh, base jet airplane. And, uh, I don't know whether anyone's ever seen it since. Now, the vehicle that you just described, how similar was it to the very first sighting that you had back in 1951? Quite similar. It was basically the same plan form vehicle. They were a double saucer, lenticular. But if you're going to be going in and out of atmospheres like Earth or other places might have, you certainly need a little more aerodynamic type of vehicle and the saucer has the capability of going through the air at tremendous rates of speed and handling the bow and trailing wave without making shock waves. So it can be very silent while traveling at big rates of speed through the atmosphere. But sightings of UFOs weren't limited to the military. Cooper has commercial airline colleagues who've also seen UFOs. He has a friend of mine who's a captain on a major airline. Uh, at night, was flying along, noticed this, suddenly a big glow came off his left wing and and he looked out and his big saucer was sitting right off their wing. And so he turned slightly toward and it moved away and turned back and it moved back in position and turned to his co-pilot and said, uh, do you see what I see? And he said, oh God, yeah, I do. And it trailed along with him for quite a period of time and tipped up, climbed very steeply away. It was on Jim McDevitt's Gemini 7 mission where they saw um, this glint of something metallic off in the distance. And he reported, and nobody had it listed on the ground, so he tried getting a picture of it, but the sun, unfortunately, was glinting off of it. It was bright, all you got is just a glint. There was no detail on what it was, but never any, uh, any further sighting at all on it. Years later, Cooper approached the United Nations with a proposal for a committee that would explore the UFO phenomenon. All right, now tell me about the letter to the UN. Well, the letter to the UN was uh, in conjunction with a meeting that I had with uh, Kurt Waldheim and the Security Council of the UN to try to encourage the UN to establish a committee to start comparing notes and data and information and to really look into all of this from an unbiased, neutral point of view. 
Here's a quote from, from your letter. I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets and are obviously a little more advanced than we are here on Earth. And are you saying that's exactly why governments have been trying to keep this information private because of that obvious advancement? Very possibly, right. I fully believe that uh, we're not alone and have for many, many years, even though but at the time I went to the moon, it was the conventional wisdom, both in science and theology, that we were alone in the universe. We're just barely out of the trees, even though we think we're rather sophisticated. But I do like to tell the story that my great-grandparents came across from southern United States to the west after our Civil War. And I went to the moon yes, less than 100 years later they came across in covered wagons. So from covered wagons to going to the moon in less than 100 years in our lifetime is a rather significant event. It tells us how primitive we have been until the modern era, and we're still pr rather primitive. Uh, because of my uh, openness to these things, I did have many of the old timers in the military and in the uh, intelligence community over the years, wanting to get it off their chest before they passed away, uh, allowed me to interview them and talk to them about it. And so my ideas became fairly well solidified in the fact we've been visited. We have to remember that right after World War II, the Army Air Force was separated and became the, Ar became the Air Force, a separate branch of service, and that the OSS, which was the Office of Special Services, was disbanded and eventually became the CIA. So that here was a major military organization and a major intelligence organization, totally in disarray, new founded, didn't know what they were doing after World War II and not really reorganized yet. And as a result of that, the President Truman at that time, um, convened a very high-level uh, committee to examine this alien or UFO phenomenon. They did come to the conclusion that it was alien, and the military uh, rightly came to the conclusion, if, this, if they're hostile, there's nothing we can do about it. Therefore, their choice was to deny it and to hush it up and create a, the National Security Act of 1947 which validated that uh, uh, deception and covered it up and allowed the group to go underground, as it were. And we've been living with that now for 50 years. And it's really the uh, beginning of the whole cover-up, the, the entire denial of this phenomenon. And uh, the addition of dismissal, disinformation, misinformation, uh, to cloak and to discourage uh, investigation, to misinform. It's just been continuous for many, many years now. Eventually it came away from the fear, I believe, of uh, not being able to protect and do their duty to uh, the notion of power and control, controlling the knowledge and the technology. And the group involved with that is still doing it. We have created our reality here and we have created it right now rather badly, for it's not a sustainable reality. We have created with our science and technology, instead of using it for the greater good, it's been captured by uh, interest, greed, self-service, uh, which is rife. And instead of using it, all of our technology and our brilliance and genius for greater good, we, we use it for self-service. And that's not going to work. It's important that we look at our civilization, our place in history, use our tools of science for greater understanding, to promote the greater good, and that's what it's all about. The question of extraterrestrial life has puzzled people for decades. Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell, he was the sixth man to walk on the moon, and he says he's certain we are not alone in the universe. He's now speaking out about why he thinks the government actually knows this to be true.
For decades, people all over the country have questioned the existence of extraterrestrial life. Hey. You guys want to see him? Blockbuster movies have been based on those suspicions. And every year, people record seeing strange objects and lights dancing across the sky. But do alien life forms really exist? Former astronaut and scientist Dr. Edgar Mitchell is one of 12 men to have walked on the moon. On January 31st, 1971, Mitchell, along with two other astronauts, embarked on the Apollo 14 mission to outer space. Now, during his nine days in space, he became the sixth man to walk on the moon. Our mission on Apollo 14 was to begin to start doing science on the moon, notably set up a science station and do a geology trek. While his nine-hour spacewalk revealed interesting facts about the surface of the moon, one of the most intriguing things that Dr. Mitchell would discover had nothing to do with his Apollo 14 mission. I did grow up in Roswell, New Mexico, which was the site of the so-called Roswell incident, and uh, was living there at the time that happened, even though there was a great deal of uh, keep people quiet from the government, uh, the lore or for many years was it, it was a UFO crash. July 1947, a mysterious explosion rocked Roswell, New Mexico. Strange debris was recovered from the scene. At first, the government said the mysterious object was a, quote, flying disc, but later explained that it was just a top secret research balloon. However, locals and UFO enthusiasts adamantly believe that what really crashed that night was an alien spacecraft. Adding to the intrigue is a deathbed admission from a public information officer on the case who said it was not only a government cover-up, but that bodies of space aliens were recovered from the site. Because I was a Roswell boy, a local person, and also I had the credibility of uh, uh, going into space and going to the moon, some of the locals came to me and some of the, a couple of the military and intelligence people came to me. They wanted to tell their story uh, because they couldn't tell it. They were sworn to secrecy. After hearing numerous accounts from seemingly credible eyewitnesses, Dr. Mitchell decided to dedicate his studies to the research of extraterrestrial life. In 1997, I uh, was in Washington and it was a disclosure conference. Um, went to the Pentagon. We asked for a, a meeting with the Intelligence uh, Committee in the Pentagon. The uh, Vice Admiral that we met with said, well, I don't know about that. And he said, I'll find out. Subsequently called and said, you were right. Uh, that program is, is there and did happen. I'm going to see if I can get into it. And we got information later that he did find uh, the people responsible for doing the current work, but was uh, resoundingly told that uh, he had no need to know, therefore he couldn't come in. But why aren't UFO research findings reported to the public? Given all the government secrecy, Dr. Mitchell says he isn't surprised that people are afraid to report their stories to authorities. Knowing many other military aviators when, who have had encounters with UFOs in, in the air and tried to talk about it, they were always debriefed by intelligence people and then told to shut up and don't say anything. But Dr. Mitchell is, quote, not the only astronaut to question the existence of extraterrestrial life. And the late Gordon Cooper, one of the original seven Mercury astronauts, was also convinced we're not alone. One of the themes of his memoir, quote, Leap of Faith, is his belief in extraterrestrial intelligence. When he was at uh, Edwards Air Force Base on duty before his selection, there was a UFO incident there that he observed, uh, got some pictures of, and tried to report it and did report it, but his pictures disappeared. We reached out to NASA for comment. They told us, quote, NASA is not involved in any sort of cover-up about alien life on this planet or anywhere else in the universe. Dr. Mitchell is a great American, but we do not share his opinions on this issue. But the question still remains, are we alone? Despite the government denials, two of the most highly trained people who have ever traveled into space firmly believe in the existence of extraterrestrial life. Should their opinions be so easily dismissed? The more we see the pictures from the Hubble telescope, and we see the immensity and the majesty of the universe, and the billions of stars, and the billions of galaxies, the knowledge that they have developed is really quite good. It should be uh, convincing anybody that what they have seen is very, very powerful.
We are now joined by a distinguished American in West Palm Beach, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut, sixth man to walk on the moon. Many of the Roswell witnesses told Dr. Mitchell their accounts, which he says were later verified by a contact at the Pentagon. What do you believe, Dr. Mitchell? Well, well I can uh, say, Larry, I have no first-hand experience, but all of my experience comes from what I call the old-timers that uh, at some point in their, before they passed on, and these were folks all gone now, uh, and because I was who I was, because I lived in the area, I grew up in the area, and because I was an astronaut, they, some of them wanted to get it off their chest before they passed on, and I happened to be selected to uh, hear their story. Mm. And uh, all of them, as I heard some of the earlier testimony, other, all of them were under very severe oaths and uh, fear and penalty uh, for talking, but uh, they did want to talk. And at some what point, do you think, I, well, Dr. Mitchell, what do you think of Bill Nye's assessment when it comes to what happened, that this was a spy balloon? I'm sorry, Bill Nye, has his, he was saying everybody's colored uh, by their beliefs and not looking at the evidence. I'm sorry, he's not either. And I think he's totally so wrong. So let me ask you. Hold on, don't interrupt. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Mitchell, I'm fine. Well, I eventually went to uh, the Pentagon and asked for a meeting with the Intelligence uh, Committee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which I got with another naval officer who had had many similar experiences. And uh, uh, we told our story. And this gentleman, a um, vice admiral, uh, said to us, well, I don't know about that, but I'm going to find out. And called a few weeks later and said he had found the source of the uh, of the black budget funding for this project and that he was going to subsequently investigate because if it was real, he should know about it. As a matter of fact, he should be in charge. That was his words. And so we did get calls from him sometime later and a report much later than that that he had found uh, the people responsible for the cover-up and for the people who were in the know and we're told, I'm sorry, Admiral, you do not have uh, uh, need to know here, and so goodbye. All right, Bill. So what? So what are you saying? So, did you first of all, did you interview these people on their deathbed or under oath? Okay, I want the viewer. I mean, I'm not going to no, change I your mind. So that's for and go for that. Then, you know, you said they sought me out. Referred they to a vice president. Out. They sought him out. Okay, you, well, yeah, but they were not on their deathbed. A deathbed declaration is quite a different thing from seeking you out and telling a story. Hey, I mean, I just, this is not no, for you. I'm, I'm not, not going to convince no, you. I am not interested in arguing with you. I'm telling my story. If you okay, want to yeah. shut up and hear it, I'll be glad to talk. Otherwise, no. Okay, I'm, I'm claiming that you haven't made a claim about aliens. You made a claim am, about a cover-up, which I'm right there with you. And you made a claim about an admiral who was not given clearance to read it. I'm right there with you on that. But go ahead about the aliens. I happen to have lived in the area, and uh, the got and I grew up in the area, and the uh, my family had uh, farming and ranch holdings and farm machinery holdings. We knew many of the people, including the ranch where it was this, this was discovered, and in spite of all of the uh, security oaths, etc., uh, the talk in the in the community was they were of what it was that it was a alien craft and that survived all of the other uh, stories and all of the other uh, oaths and so forth it was there for a long time i happened to have lived there uh, as a matter of fact uh, robert goddard uh, the father of american rocketry his farm was right down the road from ours and i walked past his home every day going there so i feel fairly well informed on all of this and like some of your earlier witnesses, Larry, <coughs> whose fathers talked to them or whose parents talked to them, and they were involved, we heard the same thing. We knew it. It was not really covered up. And so these stories did get out, even though the day after the official announcement had come out in the Roswell record in the newspaper and was refuted the next day, uh, there was a lot of uh, snickering and laughing going on about what in the world's going on here. Dr. Mitchell, we're going to do more on this. I want to invite you back for a longer period of time. Uh, you're a distinguished American. We appreciate your appearing with us. Thank you, Larry.
Dr. Edgar Mitchell, do you believe the government lies about UFO activity? Our next guest, a career military man, says it does. You're watching Larry King Live. The truth about UFOs may be painful for us to face, and this might provide a continuing rationale for the government to maintain secrecy. But the truth will and must be known eventually. Continuing our denials and fears, in my opinion, are only adding to the problem. We are all in this together. In a time of opening relationships with the Soviet Union, we have the potential for radically demilitarizing our foreign policy, reallocating those resources toward preserving our planet and opening ourselves to the global village. Part of that new reality is embracing the unknown and the possibility that we have visitors beyond the Earth or beyond our dimensions of time and space. We must enter our new openness in peace and without recrimination. Our government of the people, by the people, and for the people needs to be involved in the process, not as a hostile, separate, secret unit. I therefore advocate an orderly, non-vindictive congressional investigation of UFOs and a change in government policy on supporting research in these and other phenomena. The late philosopher Joseph Campbell once said that we are living in a time in which our ignorance and our complacency are coming to an end. It's time we let go of our fears and evolve to a higher awareness of ourselves and our place in the universe. The late J. Allen Hynek was an astronomer, just like I am. His background and mine are very similar. Uh, he uh, was for many years a professor of astronomy and so was I. And uh, what Hynek said was, UFO research is leading us kicking and screaming into the science of the 21st century. Like Hynek, I sought to debunk the reality of UFO phenomena. And like him, discovered just the opposite. I'm Dr. Brian O'Leary, former NASA astronaut. Not only is the phenomenon very real, but there's also a very elaborate cover-up. Brian O'Leary, a NASA astronaut from 1967 to 1968, originally slated for a manned mission to Mars, has also come forward. But he wasn't always a believer. I myself was once a skeptic, totally rejected the UFO phenomenon. I thought they were hallucinations, marsh gas, Venus. I was on Carl Sagan's bandwagon during the 1960s and while I was an astronaut. After I left uh, NASA, I really began to learn of what it's like to be the target of scoffing by people who would normally be my friends, my colleagues, just because I would inquire into areas that were outside of their box of inquiry. But were these attitudes passed on to all astronauts, or just to those who were interested in UFOs? Some of my uh, fellow astronauts and scientist astronauts who did go up and who have observed things uh, very clearly they, they were told not to uh, report it and about what he saw on a test pilot flight in 1952 Deke Slayton as I closed on this thing why well, it didn't look like a, a weather balloon and that's what I presumed it was and I had plenty of gas and time so I decided I'd just come back around and make a make a pass on it and uh, I got around where I should have been coming back on this thing, all of a sudden it didn't look like a balloon anymore. It looked like a, a saucer sitting on edge, about a 45 degree angle. I didn't have any gun camera film on board, unfortunately, or I'd have shot some pictures of it. And about that time, I guess whatever it was, for whatever reason, it just took off climbing at about a 45 degree angle and, and just accelerated and disappeared. And I, I obviously couldn't follow it with an old piston engine fighter. So uh, I turned around and went home. The Russian equivalent of Cape Canaveral is called Star City. Until recently, it was closed to outsiders and jealously guarded its outer space secrets. But in the wake of Glosnost, a sightings investigative team was invited to Star City. And when we got there, the first cosmonaut we spoke with told us that he had just had an encounter with a UFO. 
Sightings went to investigate cosmonaut sightings of UFOs, sightings similar to those reported by American astronauts, but dismissed by American scientists. A lot of things you see on the pictures in space are things we're used to seeing here in the control center down here in Houston. Uh, they're ordinary events that surround the spaceship, pieces coming off, uh, water dumps, pieces of ice, insulation. They're just little pieces, 10, maybe 20 feet away from the camera. But within the Soviet space program, cosmonauts insist that they have seen more than just floating scraps of space junk. I think that we are not alone in the universe. I believe that someone or something of extraterrestrial origin has visited Earth. In April of 1979, cosmonaut Viktor Afanasyev lifted off from Star City to dock with the Soviet Soyuz 6 space station. But while en route, something strange happened. Cosmonaut Afanasyev saw an unidentified object turn toward his craft and begin tailing it through space. It followed us during half of our orbit. We observed it on the light side, and when we entered the shadow side, it disappeared completely. It was an engineering structure made from some type of metal, approximately 40 meters long with inner holes. The object was narrow here and wider here, and inside there were openings. Some places had projections like small wings. The object stayed very close to us. We photographed it, and our photos showed it to be 23 to 28 meters away. In addition to photographing the UFO, Afanasyev continually reported back to mission control about the craft's size, its shape, and position. When the cosmonaut returned to Earth, he was debriefed, told never to reveal what he knew, and had his cameras and film confiscated. Those photos and his voice transmissions from space have never been released. It is only now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that Afanasyev feels he can safely tell his story. It is still classified as a UFO, because we have yet to identify the object. Spaceflight itself broadens your horizons to the point which you kind of open up to possibilities. Dr. Story Musgrave is a veteran of five American shuttle missions, who has seen and photographed several unidentified flying objects in space. Dr. Musgrave does not believe they are craft from another planet. On two of my missions, and I still don't have an answer, um, I have seen a, a snake out there, six, seven, eight feet long. It is rubbery because it has internal waves in it, and it follows you for a rather long period of time. The more you fly in space, the more you see an incredible amount of things out there, and that sort of brings to you a, really a certainty. That, uh, that other living creatures are out there. Some are incredibly primitive, more primitive than us. Some just, uh, just proteins coming together, amino acids, and some just single cell organisms. And other civilizations have been around for a million years that are doing unimaginable kinds of things. Cosmonaut Afanasyev believes that the UFO he sighted and photographed in 1979 was evidence of just this kind of distant, superintelligent civilization. Does the United States have similar evidence that they're also hiding? No, I'm sure they were divulging. That's what NASA's all about. It's about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I can see no reason that that would be classified in any way. And I wouldn't let it be. I'm an astronaut, I fly in space. I have five flights. The second I see some, I'm gonna tell somebody. Cosmonaut Pavel Popovich was one of Russia's earliest cosmonauts. He joins the ranks of an increasing number of military personnel who have testified as to the validity of the UFO phenomenon. Major General Popovich shared with us a sighting he had while flying home from Washington, D.C. with a delegation of scientists. И у меня, значит, глаза вот такие сразу стали. Смотрю рядом, практически где-то, ну, километра, может быть, полтора от нас. И где-то, может быть, километр, на, может быть, на тысячу метров выше летит объект. Причем 
правильной треугольной формы. Равнобедренный треугольник. Белый-белый, ярко-белый. Ну, я сразу, я летчик, летчик-истребитель. Я знаю многие типы летательных аппаратов, но это ни на что не похоже. Pilots contacted ground control. Ground control did not detect anything on radar, even though the object could be seen by all occupants of the plane. Он пошел параллельным курсом, да, со скоростью, если мы шли где-то примерно там 950 или 1000 км в час, то он пошел со скоростью примерно где-то 1500 минимум, потому что он обогнал нас довольно быстро, ну, по истечению где-то, может быть, секунд 30-40, вот так он прошел и э, обогнал нас. И все. И ни академики, никто ничего, абсолютно никто ничего не мог сказать, что это за бизнес. One of our pioneer astronauts was Brigadier General James McDivitt. In 1965, General McDivitt spent four days in outer space as command pilot of Gemini 4. General McDivitt, have you ever seen a UFO? Yes, uh, during the, my flight on Gemini 4 in 1965, I saw an object in space fairly close to our spacecraft that I could not identify. It looked to me like maybe the upper stage of another rocket. I tried to take some pictures of it, but unfortunately the, the pictures did not come out properly. Uh, we were, never were able to identify what it was, and all of our ground radar tracking data indicated that there shouldn't have been another object anywhere near us at the time. General McDivitt, do you know anyone else who claims to have seen a UFO? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I know all kinds of people who claim to have seen them. Some of them are very legitimate, and some of them, I think, are just having fun. I had an opportunity recently to meet a gentleman from Mississippi who claims to have actually been taken into a spacecraft. And quite frankly, I believe that that gentleman is telling what he considers to be the truth. Uh, he wasn't looking for publicity. He wasn't uh, trying to be funny. He was trying to be very honest. He was very sincere. And quite frankly, I walked away from the whole conversation with him believing that what he said is true as far as he's concerned. Well, I, I kind of thought it was people at first, you know, off like that. But of course, when they, when they appeared there in, in front of me, um, it was the most shock I've ever had in my life. One of the most puzzling incidents in space happened on mission STS-82 to service the Hubble telescope. Astronaut Steve Smith and Mark Lee reveal that they're seeing some strange flashes as they re-enter the airlock of the shuttle. Only 12 men have ever walked on the moon and uh, the man who did it the second time anyone walked on the moon was Buzz Aldrin. He was part of the first mission that got there. The NASA astronaut on Apollo 11. He's here with a model of Apollo 11. He was with the first pair with Neil Armstrong, of course. And Buzz, the panel remains so that they might want to pop something at him. But Buzz, what, what's your connection with this program? Did you, what did you see? What did I see? Uh, well, we, uh, uh, the first day out, uh, maybe six hours after uh, launch, uh, we were scheduled to make a mid-course correction. And uh, I, I'd like to show you a few things in this rocket just to point out the condition that we were in. During launch, this uh, uh, boost protective uh, cover comes off, hopefully not with the command module attached. <laughs> and, and then the first stage drops off, the second stage drops off, Unfortunately, I can't take this apart, but there's the, okay. uh, so the uh, third stage, and inside is the lunar module, and uh, this is the command and service module. Once, after going in an orbit and a half around the Earth, we fire for five minutes this engine here, and we head toward the moon. Now, shortly after that, we separate the uh, uh, command and service module, and it turns around like this, and it docks with the lunar module. 
I'm going to have to be pretty ambidextrous. Are we getting to a UFO? We're getting to that, yes. <laughs> I only ask in view of time. I know. It's well, fascinating. Uh, you don't want me to be the jury of all these people. No, now, I do don't. You? All right. Now, notice these three and four panels. Uh, when, whenever the command module separates and turns around, those panels go off uh, in four different directions. The rocket, now we're separated from the rocket, and the rocket and, and the spacecraft, the lunar module and the command module, are heading toward the moon. Now, we orient perpendicular to the plane of the sun, the earth, and the moon, and rotate slowly like this. And we can look out these windows and, and see the earth drift by and see the moon drift what by. What did you see? And I saw a light out there, okay? This is after we had witnessed the upper stage rocket uh, next to us make an evasive maneuver to miss the moon. Later missions, it crashed into the moon so that we could uh, determine the seismic uh, effect of crashing. So you into the moon. saw a light. So we saw a light, and we thought, wonder what that is. You know, there are a lot of lights out there when you're not looking in the direction of the sun. There are a lot of stars, and they're all fixed relative to each other. Now, well, one of them starts moving, or it's moving, and we know that that's another object. It's not a star. Stars don't move. How long well, they follow? move, but they're so damn far yeah, away that uh, we're not going to see How long did it follow you? Exactly. That's why I started to do this. Now, we know that uh, if we were to say, uh, uh, Houston, uh, we got a light out the window. It's going along with us, head to, heading for the moon. A lot of these guys are going to go ape, you know? <laughs> and, and it's really going to endanger the mission and occupy a lot of our time trying to explain what's going on. All right. So we very shrewdly... Neil did, said, uh, Houston, where is the upper stage? And they didn't know right away, but the, they said, we'll check with the guys in the back room. The guys in the back room in 10 minutes came back and said, it's 6,000 miles away. Oops. Well, we figured that's not what we're looking at. So uh, we started thinking a little bit more about these four panels, and I'd seen a, a graph where it showed the separation distance that was calculated before liftoff before the whole mission went, of, uh, of where these panels would be uh, in case the spacecraft made some maneuver and they guaranteed there'd be no okay, well, I'm gonna be, Hold it right there. You got me held. I'm going to uh, hold Buzz. We're going to add the governor. We'll figure it all out how to do it. <laughs> and uh, close with all of them because I'm suddenly involved in this. What the hell was that? Air Force? Buzz, what, are you, what did you see? What did I see during the flight? Yeah, you we saw, saw one of the four panels to 99.999. And these are uh, three guys who have flown in space twice and have looked out at the stars and all sorts of things. So, uh, uh, belief, belief, yes, we certainly saw something. We could see, uh, look at it in a second. So, here's one of the panels, yeah. yeah. So, that's, that's, that's it. it. That's right stuff. But there's another side to Cooper's lifetime in aviation. One that for years he would only discuss with close friends until now. It involves his personal encounters with UFOs. For him, it began in 1951 while flying in Europe for the U.S. Air Force. 
Bear Cooper and other pilots witnessed an incident that has never been officially explained. A vast armada of UFOs flying in formation at extremely high altitudes. Recently, Yolanda Gaskin spoke with Gordon Cooper. In this exclusive interview, Colonel Cooper spoke... Uh, yeah, I do. And it trailed along with him for quite a period of time and tipped up, climbed very steeply away. It was on Jim McDevitt's Gemini 7 mission where they saw um, this glint of something metallic off in the distance. And he reported, and nobody had it listed on the ground, so he tried getting a picture of it, but the sun, unfortunately, was glinting off of it. It was bright. All you got is just a glint. There was no detail on what it was, but never any, uh, any further sighting at all on it. Years later, Cooper approached the United Nations with a proposal for a committee that would explore the UFO phenomenon. All right, now tell me about the letter to the UN. Well, the letter to the UN was uh, in conjunction with a meeting that I had with uh, Kurt Waldheim and the Security Council of the UN to try to encourage the UN to establish a committee to start comparing notes and data and information and to really look into all of this from an unbiased, neutral point of view. Here's a quote from, from your letter. I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets and are obviously a little more advanced than we are here on Earth. And are you saying that's exactly why governments have been trying to keep this information private because of that obvious advancement? Very possibly, right. I fully believe that uh, we're not alone and have for many, many years, even though but at the time I went to the moon, it was the conventional wisdom Book for the first time on television about his encounters with UFOs. I read about this incident you had in 1951, and you said you saw literally hundreds of unidentifiable flying objects. Yes, they were flying quite high. How high, we couldn't tell because we couldn't get anywhere near their altitude. But they were either very large craft way up or smaller craft still well above what we could get to. For a day and a half, all of this happened. But then no one wanted to talk about it. Well, we sent a report forward on it, and, and the answer that finally came back months later was they were probably high-flying seed pods, which didn't sound very logical. There are always a lot of excuses. There's always um, the weather balloons. I've heard that one before. Oh, yeah. In yeah. 1951, you couldn't even get close to That's the true. things that were flying overhead. You or anyone else that was flying. They were faster, higher. Six years later, Cooper again encountered a UFO. This one definitely was not a weather balloon. While supervising flight testing in Edwards Air Force Base, his military camera crew actually filmed an unidentified saucer-shaped object landing near the site. As they were sitting there filming, a little saucer came from, uh, I say little saucer, it was a saucer, came flying over their heads, put down three little landing gear and landed right out on the dry lake bed. And they picked up their cameras and started over toward it, filming as they went. And when they got in fairly close to it, it lifted up, put the gear back in. Both in science and theology that we were alone in the universe. We're just barely out of the trees, even though we think we're rather sophisticated. But I do like to tell the story that my great-grandparents came across from southern United States to the west after our Civil War. And I went to the moon yes, less than 100 years later they came across in covered wagons. So from covered wagons to going to the moon in less than 100 years in our lifetime is a rather significant event that tells us how primitive we have been until the modern era, and we're still pr rather primitive. Uh, because of my uh, openness to these things, I did have many of the old timers in the military and in the uh, intelligence community over the years, wanting to get it off their chest before they passed away, uh, allowed me to interview them and talk to them about it. And so my ideas became fairly well solidified in the fact we've been visited. We have to remember that right after World War II, the Army Air Force was separated and became the, Ar became the Air Force, a separate branch of service, and that the of OSS, which is the Office of Special Services, was disbanded and eventually became the CIA. So that here was a major 
military. And the wheel wells tipped up and took off at a great rate of speed. And so they brought the, came into my office and told me what had happened, and I sent them over to develop the film, and then had to go through the, all the proper regulations of reporting this, and, and we wound up having to send the film forward to Washington in the uh, base jet airplane, and uh, I don't know whether anyone's ever seen it since. Now, the vehicle that you just described, how similar was it to the very first sighting that you had back in 1951? Quite similar. It was basically the same plan form vehicle. They were a double saucer, lenticular. But if you're going to be going in and out of atmospheres like Earth or other places might have, you certainly need a little more aerodynamic type of vehicle. And the saucer has the capability of going through the air at tremendous rates of speed and handling the bow and trailing wave without making shock waves. So it can be very silent while traveling at big rates of speed through the atmosphere. But sightings of UFOs weren't limited to the military. Cooper has commercial airline colleagues who've also seen UFOs. He has a friend of mine who's a captain on a major airline. Uh, at night, was flying along, noticed this. Suddenly a big glow came off his left wing. And, and he looked out and his big saucer was sitting right off their wing. And so he turned slightly toward and it moved away and turned back and it moved back in position and turned to his co-pilot and said, uh, do you see what I see? And he said, oh God.